I think we will go ahead and get started. I know people are still joining, but hello and thank you to everyone around the world for joining us for this week's Immunome Lab meeting, our second webinar in this exciting new series. My name is Kristen Abood. I am the science editor at the Human Immunome Project, and I will be your moderator today. We kicked off the Immunome Lab Meeting webinar series last month with Johannes Texter of Radboud University, who presented on artificial immunological intelligence and provided some great background on historical efforts to develop an artificial immune system. So if you missed that session, I'd encourage you to visit our website, humanimmunomeproject.org, to view the recording. This week, we continue showcasing the research of leading scientists who are working at the frontiers of human immunology. And today, we have a very exciting talk for you. So without further ado, it is my great pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Mark M. Davis, Director of the Stanford Institute for Immunology, Transplantation, and Infection, a professor of microbiology and immunology, and a Howard Hughes Medical Institute investigator. Dr. Davis has received numerous honors and awards, including memberships in the National Academy of Science and the Institute of Medicine. He is well known for identifying many of the T-cell receptor genes that allow these cells to recognize a diverse repertoire of antigens. His laboratory also pioneered studies of the biochemistry, genetics, and cell biology of these molecules and T lymphocytes more generally, which play a key role in orchestrating immune responses. He and his colleagues also developed a novel way to label specific T lymphocytes according to the molecules that they recognize, which is widely used in both clinical and basic immunology studies today. His current research interests involve understanding the molecular interactions that underlie T cell recognition and the challenges of human immunology, specifically obtaining a systems level understanding of immune responses to vaccination or infection. During today's presentation, please send me your questions using the Q&A function in Zoom. I will ask our speaker a broad selection of your questions after the presentation, and then we will have some time for discussion. With that, it is my pleasure to now turn it over to Mark Davis. Great. Uh, thanks, Kristen. Um, let's see. Um, right. There we go. Looks great. Right. OK. Uh, yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks for the introduction, uh, and it's a pleasure to be to be part of this series. Um, I think one of the, the greatest limitations of advancing human work in general and human immunology in particular has been uh, the paucity of, of technologies that can give us uh, precise information about the immune system function. Um, and as Kristen mentioned, uh, some years ago, we developed the peptide MHC tetramers which have been a, 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 a way in which you can label T cells according to their peptide MHC specificity. Uh, recently, we have um, improved that and have a kind of a next generation multimer, which uh, is using a ferritin backbone, uh, which is a self assembling 20 former that has, contains a biotylation signal sequence and uh, has enabled us to put 12 peptide MHCs onto a given uh, entity. And um, and this has been really very uh, much more sensitive and uh, collects a lot more specific T cells, more than we really even thought that we could get. Um, and this just shows some of the um, uh, staining with the same peptide MHC on the same cells. These are the uh, Tetramer, the, the previous generation. Uh, this is a commercial product called Dextromers, which are polymers of dextran that, that also are biotinylated and have peptide MHCs. Um, and they're more sensitive than tetramers, um, but they're also messier because they're um, polymers, basically. And 
uh, you, you have considerable background in many cases uh, as shown here. But uh, the sphere mirrors that, we, that we're talking about here for, with the ferritin uh, are discrete uh, nanoparticles essentially. And so they have um, more uniform characteristics and, and can give us um, you know, cleaner, not only the, a greater sensitivity, but also uh, cleaner uh, profile. Um, and what's uh, what's was surprised us was that they uh, were able to label quite a bit more, two or three times more cells. Um, so, for instance, um, comparing uh, th this data, this is a, a flu uh, specificity versus uh, a uh, p fifty sixty five, which is a, a cytomegalovirus specificity, and you can see uh, with the tetramer you get. 0.18 of the cells, but with the sphere mirror, you get uh, almost uh, 0.4. Uh, similarly, with the, the flu tetramer, um, you get almost three times more cells uh, with that reagent. So this is a big deal. I mean, you're always uh, struggling for uh, cell numbers in terms of this, but if you're in the business of, of sorting or analyzing specific T cells, you, you, you're always uh, scraping for uh, material and uh, to get two or three times more cells, that's that's a, a huge bonus. Uh, plus, when we do the analysis of T cell receptor sequences and so forth, we, we are pulling in a much broader swath of um, uh, specificities. So really, I mean, it makes sense in terms of you're reaching down into lower avidity T cell receptors. Um, that's, uh, you're, you're going to, get a broader picture of the repertoire. And in this uh, paper, when where we introduced the technology last year, um, we found uh, we particularly focused it on looking at areas of conservation uh, peptides that were conserved between SARS-CoV-2 and uh, circulating coronavirus. There are like four major uh, circulating coronaviruses listed here. And we zeroed in on uh, areas that were conserved versus areas that were not with SARS-CoV-2. And, and what we found basically was that people that had a mild disease um, course in COVID um, favored these conserved residues versus people that had more severe disease uh, did not. And, and the, typically this is uh, yellow here is are, are the, uh, more unique SARS-CoV-2. So, um, and this might reflect uh, recent encounters with these uh, coronaviruses, which are not, you know, uh, basically just a, a common cold type of thing, nothing uh, like COVID. So, um, so anyway, this can, uh, uh, it, I think adds to um, how we can understand the widely varying. Uh, outcomes of COVID. Some people never notice they have it, and other people get very sick and die. Uh, so that's that's about as a extreme as a range as you can get. So so we think this partially explains that that phenomena. Uh, we've now moved on um, in a, a a new paper uh, that we hope will be uh, accepted soon, where we have made. We have uh, one with uh, Kari Naido and others here at Stanford. We we um, had a sort of faculty student uh, vaccination project, which uh, many of us, including myself, uh, participated in. And so uh, as soon as the vaccines came out, particularly the Pfizer vaccine with BioNTech, um, we got to work um, actually like the day before Christmas or something um, and um, did a, a very nice uh, and extensive time course. Um, and to um, to look at that, we, we made spheremers for all the predicted uh, spike uh, epitopes for HLA-A2, um, and also, uh, which is a class one MHC, that's quite common. And then we also uh, made uh, for class two, we did a DR-1501, which is also fairly common, not as common as A2, but, but common enough such that in the 60 some people in the cohort were able to find at least a dozen that had the right MHC and so that we could survey them. And um, what was really nice was that um, we got whopping 
responses for, in this case, sp spike-specific CD8 cells. Uh, some of them uh, at the peak were 8% of the, this particular epitope was 8% of the, of, of all the CD8 cells in, in these uh, individuals. And the other ones were not shabby either, 4%, uh, 5%. Overall, uh, something like 20% at the peak of, of all the CD8 cells were uh, in A2 individuals were uh, specific for one or the other of, of these uh, multiple spike proteins. Um, in the class two uh, CD4 range though, it was uh, somewhat different, not as widely distributed. There was basically one, one or two uh, major epitopes um, for spike in for DR15 that were predicted, and uh, this one was like 12 percent at the at the peak. Uh, in this case, the peak came a week after the boost, um, and this one was also really quite good too. So, uh, so we're really getting a very uh, we're, we're showing that the um, RNA vaccines are are giving us tremendously large um, uh, both CD8 and CD4 responses that are specific for the the spike epitopes, the, the vaccine only contains the spike protein, not, not uh, some of the other ones. Although now we've made reagents that include uh, quite, a, quite a number of the other ones, uh, like 40 in total. Um, but the, um, if you compare the CD8 response um, between people who are getting this vaccine versus infected individuals with COVID, uh, there's a huge difference in the um, uh, in the two, and particularly the uh, vaccination produces uh, almost tenfold more CD8 cells than uh, infection. So it's consistent with recent reports that um, the virus uh, inhibits class one expression. We didn't see as big a difference. We saw a slight difference with the CD4 uh, T cells, but but uh, this is pretty pretty whopping, and um, it also. Um, it seems that people that uh, there were uh, a number of people in the study had had COVID earlier before they got the vaccine, and they had a significantly reduced um, response. So, um, yeah, by by tenfold in in many cases. So it seems that um, having COVID uh, reduces your um, ability to respond to the vaccine um, as well as a naive person. Uh, and that's consistent with some other data we've uh, had and published uh, last year or so uh, on HIV and, and um, hepatitis C, where the, these, these serious infections uh, damage your immune system in significant ways that um, can be quite, uh, it can last a lot longer uh, even after the infection the infection is over, uh, particularly hepatitis C, where you can basically take a drug and stop the whole of the disease. Um, the um, sequelae of that go on for quite some time. So um, another topic that we've gotten into, partly because we developed the uh, single cell T cell technology uh, quite a number of years ago, um, and, and enabled us to dive deeply into both human and mouse uh, responses. Um, and it comes back to a uh, one of the uh, major problems er in early immunology, which is that there was a whole field of CD8 suppressor T cells that um, was quite extensive. Uh, there were thousands of papers, a lot of people involved, but the assays were not very robust, and people managed to fool themselves quite a bit so that the whole all business collapsed, um, and I joked that it was like the Titanic. Um, so, um, so we got in, into this uh, just accidentally, in a way, because we were Arnold Hahn and the group was uh, interested in celiac disease, and he did a whole project characterizing um, T cells, especially, but other cells as well in in celiac disease, where you challenge celiac patients uh, that are on a gluten free diet. Uh, with some gluten, uh, and that induces a mild form of the disease. Um, and we're great, very grateful for uh, individuals that volunteered for this study because it's you know you're you're volunteering to get sick. It's not it's not really 
uh, they're, they're not really benefiting. But we benefited, or the research benefited tremendously because uh, not only did we see in, an increase in um, gluten-specific CD4 cells in the blood uh, six days post-challenge, which was expected based on other people's data, uh, but what was surprising was we also saw a real surge, an even more dramatic surge in CD8 T cells and gamma delta T cells in the same patients. And they're all coming up at the same time as the CD4 cells and all and going away at the same time as well. And so that was just so curious and no one, no one knew what to make of that, including us. Um, and so uh, it's something that sort of nagged at me. You know, I, I compare it with... Um, you know, uh, if if you're um, wearing a sweater and you see a, a bit of yarn coming out of the sweater, your mother would have told you not to pull on that. That that's that would be very bad for a sweater. So, uh, but but in science, if you see something that doesn't fit anyone's expectations about what should be happening, uh, you want to pull on that. You want to. Uh, look at that more closely if you can uh, and try to figure out what's going on. Something's going on that um, you probably wouldn't want to know about. And um, and so we uh, what, what brought about progress was a, a, a new postdoc came in the lab in the Risha Saldagrama, and he had done his PhD on the this EAE model of demyelination in mice, quite a popular model um, that's uh, induced with a bigger uh, myelin peptide um, and so I asked him, could you just look at the blood of these mice and see if you see anything like what we saw in celiac? And so he did. And uh, amazingly, uh, he saw the same thing, that 10 days after induction of the disease, there was a surge of CD4 T cells, CD8 T cells, and gamma delta T cells, all at the same time point. And then a week later, the same cells uh, came back in the blood and it kind of rebounded a way that is actually reminiscent of relapsing, remitting uh, MS, for example. Um, and looking at the nervous system, you could see some of those same surges um, were going on. So that really um, said, well, okay, something's happening here. It's, uh, and it's happening both in human humans and mice. So that was um, very special and uh, worthy of pursuit. And so we were able to pursue this in great detail, um, and uh, and what we found was that the CD4 cells, as expected, were pathogenic. The gamma delta cells make IL-17, which is also part of the pathogenesis. But the CD8 cells were a real mystery, and it took us years to figure out what was happening there. And, and luckily, we're collaborating with Chris Garcia, who had uh, developed this uh, peptide library method that that you could take a TCR, TCR receptor you were interested in probe the library and, and on a good day you can get uh, find out what the peptide was so uh so we did that with the cd8 cells um and uh and found some peptides and put those into the eae induction model and uh to our surprise they suppressed the disease so it turned out that the cd8 cells here are are suppressors um and that the mice if you put if you stimulated those CD8 cells with specific peptides, you um, got much, uh, many, most of the mice didn't get any disease, but, and the few that did got a very mild form. And it turned out this was, this um, was connected to a particular subset of CD8 cells that expressed the Live49 family of proteins, um, as originally uh, described by Harvey Cantor at uh, Dana-Farber, and he had been uh, identified these cells as suppressive in the context of a particular uh, non-classical class one molecule in mice called QA1. Uh, but in our data, we showed that um, these cells were really the active principle in the suppression and and were not confined to QA1, but also could um, uh, interact with the classical class one MHCs. Um, so, um, and that they killed basically that that in culture we could show that these cells, the life 49 positive CD8 cells induced in this method uh, could kill uh, the mod specific CD4 cells. 
And, uh, and so uh, we published that several years ago, uh, but really anxious to move on to human work. Uh, and this is, uh, uh, Narisha went off, uh, he's now on the faculty of Washington University in St. Louis. Uh, a new postdoc, Jing Lee, came in um, and she has done a tremendous amount of work um, exploring the, the human side of this, uh, since we're seeing basically the same thing happening to humans. In humans, they don't express uh, life 49, but they express cure, which is uh, an analogous uh, molecule, uh, and also is on a small subset of CD8 cells, just like life 49 is on a small subset of maybe 5% of the CD8 cells. In mice, uh, the cure is expressed even smaller percentage, one or 2% of the CD8 cells. And so uh, Jing got to work and, and through uh, collaborators like uh, uh, PJ Utz and, and Bill Robinson here at Stanford, um, we were able to immediately start looking at blood samples from autoimmune patients and we could immediately see that in some lupus patients, there was huge levels that, that instead of being one or 2% of the CD8 cells, there were 25 or 20% uh, of, of the CD8 cells. So really something was happening there. And just in general, across multiple diseases, uh, this is lupus versus MS versus celiac. Um, while many of the patients had uh, normal levels at the time of the blood draw, uh, there were always some that had um, much higher levels, uh, again, suggesting something was going on there. Uh, and probably, but the most convincing data really came from collaborating with Nielsen Fernandez Becker, where uh, we were able to get gut samples um, from uh, both healthy controls and patients and look for these uh, care positive CD8 cells. And we could see a clear correlation with um, disease severity. Um, even celiacs on the um, gluten free diet had. Um, a small, uh, you know, uh, generally we're above normal levels, uh, but then celiacs that were having a severe uh, disease course uh, were, were much higher. So, um, so that that indicates that there's a connection here, um, and that we imagine the connection is about if you have a, a autoimmune disease like celiac, you're trying to combat it with these cells. Um, and the, and we've also seen in vitro that we can kill, that these uh, cure-positive CD8 cells can kill gluten-specific cells in culture, whereas cure-negative uh, CD8 T cells do not. Um, so, uh, but then we did an extensive amount of single-cell gene expression and so forth using uh, the current methods, and we just couldn't see any real difference in the gene expression between wasn't like the uh, these cure CD8 cells in patients were uh, going rogue or something in some some strange way. No, they were basically were just the same. There there could be more of them or less of them, but we didn't we didn't see any systematic difference in their um, gene expression. Not that you know there might be, and and that would require a lot more um, investigation. But but at least um, we we didn't see anything. So. Um, so this uh, reminded us of a, a paper we published uh, several years ago, 2015, where we made the surprising discovery that um, self-specific T cells were not rare in healthy people. There were ton there are tons of self-specific T cells running around healthy people, uh, uh, which is a, contrary to a dogma that was established uh, decades ago in mouse models where there seemed to be um, a very efficient deletion in the thymus of, of cell-specific cells uh, using transgenic models. But basically we could tell that this actually was uh, uh, exaggerated in the transgenic models and that where there is there was some deletion of cell-specific cells, it wasn't nearly as uh, efficient. So that leaves a lot uh, still there. And uh, in this paper, so we had to discuss uh, or, or thought to discuss what why would this be why would you make uh, take a risk of autoimmunity in these cell specific cells um, by having them around in, instead of deleting them and the um, inescapable argument was uh, well you're keeping them around because you might need them in an infection 
Um, and this, uh, we, we followed up with some data uh, where we could sell, tell that these cells were normally not easy to activate, um, but inf an infection-like circumstance uh, could do that, that especially um, innate immune activation and, and molecules that do that um, seem to be key. So um, so then in, in terms of thinking of a normal role for these cells, we thought, well, okay, let's look at some infected people. Um, and um, and so we did, and it turned out this was at the height of the early uh, days of the uh, pandemic. And so there were tons of people in the hospital uh, with COVID. Uh, and in no time at all, uh, Karina Nado, our collaborator, uh, managed to give us like 60 some um, blood samples from uh, people in, in the um, hospital. Um, and sure enough, we saw, especially in the more severe uh, cases, we saw a, a dramatic increase in the number of cure positive CV cells. Um, and this is the kind of full, full on data. Um, and it clearly was the trend, and the more severe uh, COVID patients had had more of these cells. So, um, so this fit with a, a model uh, where infection um, breaks tolerance, so that some of these cell-specific cells that normally would be repressed, um, if they have uh, cross-reactivity to uh, pathogen antigens, uh, they can be they can break free and and um, uh, help help defend against the infection. Uh, in contrast, uh, CD4 regulatory T cells, which have been just were discovered 25 or so years ago, and and have been the the mainstay of work on T cell suppression ever since, uh, they are not doing anything obvious in the course of a COVID. Um, and so our hypothesis is that. Um, cells leave the thymus based on some degree of self-reactivity. And sometimes that's a very modest self-reactivity, but other times it can be quite dramatic. It can be, they can be stained with tetramers with cell-specific epitopes. The, these cells are potentially dangerous. They're generally kept um, as uh, difficult to activate, uh, but if you have an infection, uh, they could be activated and then you need to control them uh, to prevent autoimmunity. And so um, to test this hypothesis, uh, Jing made a um, conditional knockout of the main uh, uh, Li49 uh, family member, Li49F, in, uh, in mice. That's in 90% of the um, Li49 positive CD8 cells in mice. And, um, and sure enough, you infect these mice with uh, of a virus called LCMV, uh, you get a, a spike in the level normally, but in the knockout mice, uh, you had very little. Almost there's almost nothing left of of these cells. So, um, but most and and there's very little effect on the natural killer cells, which are which also express this gene. But the, the natural killer cells express a, a much broader range, and they're I think not so dependent on the Li49 F as the CD8 cells are. Um, but the proof of the pudding is actually, if you infect the mice, normally uh, you don't get autoimmunity in terms of antibody deposits in the kidneys in this particular model. But um, with the knockout mice, you do. You're, um, and you, you get some of the other uh, hallmarks of, of um, this kind of knock and knocking out this kind of gene going back to uh, work of Harvey Kanner's where you see an increase in terminal center B cells and also an increase in um, follicular helper cells, uh, which is interesting for, for other reasons. But anyway, I think this, this um, says that these cells are really important in controlling auto autoimmunity that could arise from um, infection. And we know in autoimmunity in general, that uh, in many cases, uh, autoimmunity, clinical autoimmunity follows a serious infection. Uh, so, so we think that these cells are critical in preventing autoimmunity normally, uh, and that something is going wrong in this pathway um, uh, when autoimmunity happens. And we don't know what's going wrong, uh, but that's, that's something we're very keen to understand. Um, in terms of the generality of this finding, 
uh, some new uh, unpublished data is um, has been very interesting in in terms of pregnancy. Here we've collaborated again with Karine Do, uh, who had a, quite a massive number of uh, samples from women in the second trimester of pregnancy. And uh, what uh, Jing is finding is that in general, um, care positive CD8 cells are elevated in pregnancy somewhat, so fairly subtle, but but noticeable. Uh, and especially women with a, um, a male fetus have um, even more elevated levels. So um, so I think this is this is interesting in terms of the generality of these cells. Uh, because and a major problem in pregnancy understanding pregnancy is how how is it that the immune system of a pregnant woman generally doesn't uh, uh, attack the fetus, which has all sorts of other antigens uh, and males as much as any. So um, so anyway, so this the the, the promises to be a, a really important area, both in understanding autoimmunity and in understanding uh, uh, fetal tolerance and pregnancy. Um, and then lastly, I want to uh, mention work on um, immune organoids. And this got started um, partly because working with the Gates Foundation, we uh, learned that many uh, vaccines have failed in uh, clinical trials in severe diseases like HIV and TB and malaria. Uh, we're really still looking for um, good vaccines in that area. And that's that's been going on for decades. Um, and this says we, you know, even though the um, the, the SARS-CoV-2 vaccines have been really uh, quite effective, um, a lot of vaccines have not, and they're just trickier diseases that have been around for a long time uh, in most cases, and and so we have to uh, understand them a lot better, and probably make a, a whole new generation of of vaccines that would be more effective. But how to do this, um, the basic problem is you can only do so much in uh, living human beings, um, uh, it's quite limited actually. We've done, we've done a lot of uh, flu vaccine studies, but you're up against the wall in terms of getting really much detail about this. So, um, so it seemed really uh, useful to try to develop a new model to understand uh, vaccination. And this is uh, work started uh, by a um, Tremendous postdoc, uh, Lisa Weger, who's now at uh, on the faculty at UC Irvine. Um, and Lisa found that we could take tonsils, which are readily um, available from both children and adults. Um, hundreds of thousands are whacked out every year. Um, and they're basically huge lymph nodes and have billions of lymphocytes. And Lisa basically found that you could dissociate these cells and culture them uh, such that they could make immune responses and um, form germinal centers and dark zones and light zones. Uh, but especially, uh, you could vaccinate them with um, particular flu vaccines and get antibodies after a week or two. Um, and subsequent work showed that we could get uh, what's called affinity maturation, which is uh, these cells that have uh, some affinity, low affinity for an antigen uh, uh, go through the dermal center, are mutated, and uh, selected for having higher affinities. And we could show that this was happening in this in this system. And so, uh, and and a lot of other things that I won't be able to mention here. But uh, the paper was uh, we published a paper last year on this, and and it's become um, we're doing a tremendous amount of work in the lab uh, now to. Um, follow that up, but but just the basics are that we we can put human immunity in a dish and test vaccines, but also understand all, all sorts of other things that might be going on. And um, just a, a bit about uh, uh, recent unpublished data, uh, I told you about CD8 T cells um, and, and the paper that came out um, this year, earlier, um, and uh, as as putting it alongside of the much better understood uh, CD4 T regs, um, so how are we going to understand the relationship between these two? Um, and so here we've turned to the tonsil organoid system that Lisa developed, uh, and a, a, a student uh, Mustafa Ganazada and a postdoc Xin Chen 
uh, have worked out a really clever way to um, interrogate these cultures and and look at the role of these two different types of regulatory cells um, in one uh, in one package. And basically, what they've been able to do is to use CRISPR-Cas9 electroporating um, constructs that will knock out picker genes, um, and then we can look at the, the phenotype, of the resulting cultures and. Uh, this is one example of, of these knockouts, um, and we get about 80% reduction in the level, in this case, of FOXP3. And um, the cool thing is that if we eliminate FOXP3, which is the main driving transcription factor for the CD4 Tregs, now the tonsils will make autoantibodies, which they wouldn't before. So uh, you could do all kinds of things, simulate with autoantigens. Nothing, nothing will happen in the way of uh, producing secreted antibodies. But if you knock out FOXP3, now this sort of simulation will work. So we could tell that there's there's a significant barrier that the, the CD4 Tregs are actually uh, a checkpoint against autoantigens. And it's also well known that um, in both humans and mice, uh, gene, if you, if you Im impair uh, FOXP3, uh, one of the characteristics of you know severe inflammation and so forth are the auto autoantibodies that uh, suddenly happen. So um, so that's really uh, good. We're we're doing parallel experiments with the cure positive CD8 cells, and um, uh, they don't have the same function, but they also they do uh, uh, regulate self specific T cells. So um, anyway, so that's a that's something we're. Uh, finishing up and uh, hopefully will be interesting. Um, the other thing we're trying to do is combine organoids. So we have the uh, spleen and skin from the same donor uh, using organ donor network. And so that's um, looking looking interesting in terms of connecting different tissues in, in organoids um, in a way that, that normally happens in a, a whole organism. So um, I think that's... Um, all I want to talk about right now and, and um, thank the many people that have um, made this possible in, in my group, especially um, Elsa Sol, uh, Lisa, Shin, Mustafa, uh, Jing, um, tremendous uh, people, many other. Also great collaborators like Kari Nado and Nielsen Fernandez Becker, Chris Garcia, um, and really uh, patient uh, funding agencies like the Gates Foundation, and Howard Hughes, um, NIH especially, um, and uh, Donor Network West, which has uh, been the source of uh, spleens and, and tissue from um, organ donors. So I'll stop there and answer any questions. Well, thank you so much. That was really a fascinating talk, and we have a lot of questions coming in for you. So we'll start from the top. Um, the first question is with the spheromers. Is there a trade-off between sensitivity and specificity? And if you clone the T cell receptors from the additional cells you get with the spheromers, are they all peptide specific? Yeah, we we did uh, we did that in the uh, in the original science immunology paper, and um, you know we did, we haven't done it on every every single thing, but but in the examples that we picked out that were unique in terms of their T cell receptor sequences. Uh, they had the correct specificity when when put into uh, jerk out reporter cells. Okay. And um, the next question was, how do you adjust for the time difference between the vaccination and infection for COVID with regards to the assessment of the CD8 T cell response? Um, does that mean in terms so, of infection? Yeah, I think it was the the, the noticeable difference yeah. you saw in the CD8 T cells when the uh, vaccination occurred after infection. How do you account for a time difference? Does the time seem to have be any factor there between infection and vaccination? Um, yeah, that's very difficult to control for because you know people got COVID at various times and then months later, I mean months later, then they got the vaccine. Right. Um, but uh, there just there were only a handful of people in that category. Um, I think we have some new data that that then will will be a more uniform time frame um, of infection because these are people that were part of an infection study and a treatment study, um, and then 
some weeks or months after that study was what uh, they recovered, uh, they were given a vaccine. Uh, so I think some uh, uh, new data on that will will be a little more uniform. But you kind of again with humans, you you've got to kind of get what you can when when you can. Um, That's right. That's right. And then also on the CD8 responses um, with COVID, does an infection after a vaccination also show an attenuated CD8 response? I think you addressed that, but. No, yeah, we we do not have, um, we don't have data on that. That of course is very interesting and, and um, definitely I think how things will evolve, um, but uh, we, we, we don't have anything on that right now. Okay, so now moving to the the cure positive CD8 positive cells observed in celiac, um, were they detected in blood or intestinal biopsy samples? And um, the person asking is wondering if it could be considered as a biomarker of disease disease severity that you could potentially easily measure in the blood of patients. Yeah, uh, that's. I mean, we've we've been very interested in that. Um, that. And, and we've looked, um, done some work to look at flares in lupus patients. We didn't really see anything that particularly correlated with the flares. Uh, we definitely, the gut biopsies in celiac definitely are, um, there was a clear correlation. And, and so that could be considered a, a biomarker. Um, in the blood, it's, I think we still have to, there's some subtleties there that, um, I don't think we really understand. We have to uh, look at some more samples. Uh, yeah, we, we're we're, um, we're we're looking at some um, some long term studies of MS patients mm -hmm. with uh, Jeff Dunn here at Stanford, and I think that's you know where where people have a well under uh, you know managed uh, clinical cohort um, getting serial samples from the same patients. And correlating that with drug treatments and and um, uh, disease course will be critical, but that's uh, that takes some time to do. Right. Right. Okay. So we had two questions related to the cure expression on the CD8 cells, and it seems to be within two populations of intermediate and high expression. Um, and we had one question was whether that was a technical or a biological difference. I think it's a bi it's a biological difference, and and this is something that was noticed uh, years ago that uh, uh, cure expressing CD8 cells that were activated had the lower level of cure expression. So uh, it it seems to be a, a marker of um, a recent activation, uh, and yeah, it's something we'd like to understand a lot more because I think it's there's there's information there that that could be very valuable, but I wouldn't say we have a, a much of an understanding of it other than what I just said. Okay. And is there a particular subset of the cure positive CD8 T cells that are more regulatory in humans or are they quite homogenous? Well, we're pretty sure that the cure um, positive CD8s in general are not part of the, uh, the immune response against the pathogen. Okay. Uh, they have a much more restricted repertoire based on TCR sequencing that we've done. Uh, they're they're um, very you know uh, might just be a, a handful of of reagents on, uh, of antigens um, that they're specific for, and definitely that specificity is important um, in terms of their activity. It's not not like that's just decorative. It's definitely I think part of um, they're recognizing things on self-specific cells mm -hmm. um, that uh, that they're um, they're regulating. So that's how they, uh, you know, I imagine without having too many specifics on this, is uh, uh, that self-specific cells are making unusual um, have some unusual gene expression characteristics, and I think those are targets. That's that's what's being targeted. Mm -hmm. uh, my guess. And have you found any cure positive CD8 T cells in patients with type one diabetes? Well, they're definitely there. Um, and uh, we're actually just, uh, we've just been working with the Teddy Foundation, which has 
a great collection of um, samples from children that are at risk for diabetes and some of whom uh, got diabetes. Um, and so we have serial samples. We're just uh, analyzing those now. In fact, I'm going to later today, I'm, I'm meeting with uh, the postdoc, uh, Jing, who's looking at that. So I'm hoping, <laughs> hoping there'll be something exciting there. But uh, report uh, back. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Um, and what do you think the role of these CD8 cells would be in a condition like a cytokine storm? Yeah. Uh, I think a, a cytokine storm uh, might be brought about by something completely different mm -hmm. uh, or by a failure of these cells okay. uh, to act. Um and so, uh, yeah, some, something has gone terribly wrong in a cytokine storm, but it is it does come up in different uh, situations. And and um, I don't think we have a really great understanding of all those situations. Definitely CAR-T therapy uh, can, can induce a cytokine storm. Um, I'm not sure people really understand why, why that is right. um, or, or what the molecular determinants are. But... Um, yeah, it's definitely something to, to think about just in terms of immune dysregulation in general or inappropriate immune responses in general. Um, I, I would imagine there there is some role for these cells, but we, we don't have any specific information. Do we know which cytokines they secrete? Uh, yeah, they, uh, they're very big on uh, perforin and granzyme B. Okay. Um, so, uh, and they actually, they express more of that constitutively than uh, cure negative CD8 cells. Okay. Uh, so it seems like they're, they're primed to kill. Mm -hmm. uh, and and that's, uh, that's the mechanism. Okay. And would you expect that they would be uh, present across all animal species or many animal species? Well, I think it, we're seeing similar things in mice and humans. So I think they probably are ubiquitous, uh, at least across mammals. Okay. Um, but we haven't we haven't tried to do any uh, evolutionary studies, for example. Right. Okay. And do you think it would be possible to induce or expand antigen-specific cure-positive CD8 T cells by using vaccines, for example? Um. Well, I think we definitely. Um, it's definitely uh, would be important to expand these cells in autoimmunity as a potential treatment for autoimmunity. And I'm working with a, a company um, that's trying to do that. Okay. Um, so, uh, right, I, I think that would be the obvious um, uh, thing. But of course, they, they could be useful for various things. But uh, I think the most obvious one right now is, uh, can you manipulate these cells to do a better job in terms of autoimmunity? Which is interesting, right? Because you usually think of, to control autoimmunity, of dampening the immune response. And this is actually... Well, this, that's the job of these secure CD8 yeah. cells is, is uh, clearly is to uh, kill uh, uh, exactly under what circumstances, not completely clear. Right. Um, in vivo, but um, they definitely have the potential to kill self-reactive cells. They don't hurt other cells. So uh, we see the gluten-specific CD4 cells are targeted by these cells in vitro and not, uh, say, flu-specific uh, CD4 cells or CD4 cells generally. Yeah. Uh, so so that's, that's actually where the T-cell receptor specificity comes in is they're they're seeing something on these cells. I think these cells are, you know, self-specific cells are imprinted in some way in the thymus, is my yeah. guess, um, to express antigens that normal uh, cells don't. Yeah. Um, and that these are the the targets. That's very fascinating. Is there any information on how this population, this cure positive T cell population, changes with age? Uh no, we, we should know that. Um, <laughs> and we have we have aging studies that we haven't uh, tapped into on, on this, but uh, that that's definitely on the agenda to, yeah. to look at. 
Yeah. And have you looked at the CD8 positive cure cells in tumor microenvironments or lymph nodes of patients with cancer? Yeah. No, I think that's a really interesting area. And I, uh, and, you know, I think if you, if you say, what are you trying, what are you trying to do in immunotherapy of cancer is you're trying to activate cells that are specific for the tumor, which right. are normally inhibited because they're seen as self-specific. So, uh, so these cure cells could actually be holding back effective responses uh, in cancer uh, by inhibiting those things. And, and we have seen in a mouse model, we have seen that in a, a immune therapy where we're injecting the mice with uh, nanoparticles that stimulate uh, cells specific for the cancer in the tumor um, and, and inhibit or even cure um, uh, the tumor in, in the mice. Uh, we do see that the, the FOXB3 positive uh, regulatory CD4 cells decrease and these cells uh, increase to some extent. Uh, but looking at human samples, uh, it hasn't, the, the, the results have been mixed. Uh, and I'm not sure why that is, but but I, uh, I I would be pretty sure these cells are involved somehow in and probably uh, you know inhibiting immunotherapy. They're not they're not going to be helpful. Right. Uh, mm -hmm. That's really fascinating. Um, we have a question on whether you could comment on the effect of checkpoint inhibitors on the cure positive CD8s. Right. So that's been the kind of um, something we started to look at. And, and we've seen a few examples of patients that have a spike in cure positive CD8 cells uh, following checkpoint therapy, but it hasn't been consistent. Um, and um, we have a collaborator who uh, has a really good cohort. I mean, part of this is having really good cohorts. Uh, and we have a, a collaborator who's been uh, uh, following up on this and um, I haven't heard haven't heard back yet on on the results, but right. uh, but I would imagine since since um, you know we got into celiac. Arnold Hahn's argument was this: the only um, type of autoimmunity you can legally induce in <laughs> in volunteers. Uh, <laughs> we have certainly checkpoints are a whole other mm -hmm. realm of autoimmunity that we're accidentally inducing. Right. In, in many patients. And so I, I really expect there'd be something, something here. Um, but, um, and, and again, enhancing in that case, enhancing the ability of, of these care positive CD8 cells to act, uh, could, could be helpful there. Yeah. Uh, but, uh, we don't know yet. Yeah. Maybe one last question on the, the celiac, which is, does the, does COVID infection actually exaggerate celiac symptoms? Oh, uh, not that I know of. Uh, it, we haven't looked specifically at that. Um, it definitely in the, um, in the COVID studies we did do and, and in the paper, um, the, uh, people with more severe disease had vasculitis okay. uh, or one of, one of the, um, sequelae of, of COVID-19 in severe cases is, is vasculitis, which, uh, may or may not be similar to, uh, a, one of the classical autoimmune diseases. So it basically means the inflammation of the vasculature. Um, uh, definitely there were, there were higher levels of, um, cure positive CD8 cells in the patients with uh, vasculitis. Um, but uh, yeah, again, it's, uh, whether that carries over into other types of autoimmune diseases, I don't know. Somebody right. probably knows. Right. <laughs> yeah. Well, I thank you so much, Dr. Davis, for you know, just sharing your broad wisdom and, and insights on, on all of this fascinating work in immunology and um, for taking so many questions from our audience. I'm pretty sure we could probably keep you for another hour uh, going through them. But I know um, that it's a very early hour for you and we really do appreciate your time. It's my and pleasure.
Thank all you right. also to all of today's attendees for participating in the webinar and for submitting such excellent questions. Um, we're so glad as always to have you join us and we look forward to many more engaged discussions. And I'll just let you know that the next Immunome Lab meeting, which is now a monthly webinar series, will take place on Thursday, December, I'm sorry, this is the wrong uh, date here, but um, it will take place on Thursday, January 12th at 10 a.m. Um, that day, we will host Dr. Anand Matabushi from Emory University, who will be presenting on AI across multiple length scales, predicting response to immunotherapy. There's no need to register for the webinar in advance. Please just visit our website at www.humanimmunoproject.org to obtain the link, and please do share it with your friends and colleagues. And while you're there, please sign up for the newly launched Immunome Report, which will feature voices of researchers working at the frontiers of human immunology and AI and provide all of the in-depth and interesting coverage you've received in the past from the COVID report. An issue will be coming out soon, so please sign up now so you don't miss out. And finally, please visit our website and follow us on social media, where we will post a recording of today's webinar. You can also find a recording of last month's webinar there and um, as well as the previous COVID um, lab meetings. So thank you again for participating today and we look forward to seeing you next month at the Immunome lab meeting. Thank you so much.